Hi, this is Tina Nam. Welcome to the AS in the Air online activity. This May, we will host a series of special talks about modular self-reconfigurable robots to help promote knowledge sharing and technological advancement in this field. Today, it is the second week in this series. It is our great pleasure to have two well-renowned scholars share their wisdom with us. There will be a Q&A session after each talk. You are welcome to interact with our speaker by typing your question in the chat box or asking questions directly with your microphone if you are using Zoom. All right, uh, I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker, Professor Alka Esbet. Uh, professor Alka Esbet is a professor at uh, EPFL. Uh, he is an IEEE fellow and head of the Bio Robotics Laboratory. He has a Bachelor of Science and Master of Science degree in physics from the EPFL and a PhD degree in AI from the University of Edinburgh. His research interests are at the intersection between robotics and computational neural science. He has interested in using numerical simulations and robots to gain a better understanding of animal locomotion and movement control, and in using inspiration from biology to design novel types of robots and locomotion controller. And he is also interested in assisting persons with limited mobility using exoskeletons and assistive furniture. With his colleagues, he has received many paper awards such as at ICRA, Humanoids, Romance, and CROA. He is an associate editor for the International Journal of Humanoid Robotics and the IGBE Transaction on Medical Robotics and Bonetics. He is also a member of the Board of Reviewing Editors of Science Magazine. The topic he is going to share with us today is investigating and assisting locomotion using modular robots. Without further delay, let's welcome Professor Alka Eisberg. Great, okay. right. thank you very much, Dean Luan, for the nice uh, introduction and invitation. I'm very excited to be here today, indeed, to talk about uh, modular robots, not only reconfigurable robots, but also just modular robots that have a fixed shape. So uh, my talk will have two parts. Uh, the first one, indeed, I'd like to show a bit how we use our modular robots to investigate animal locomotion. Um, I'm really a fan of animal locomotion. The more I do robotics, the more I'm impressed by animal locomotion. And I think the concept of modular robotics can be a very important tool to understand how animals move. The second part will be exactly on the topic of this workshop or this series of, of presentation. It's about self equivalent robotics with our Roombots project, which um, I'll, I'll present as well. So, more generally, my, my field of research is biorobotics, this very exciting field of research where people use all kinds of uh, animal-like robots. It can be legged robots, it can be flying robots, or it can be swimming or crawling robots. This is a, a sub-part of robotics, but super exciting uh, because of these nice interlinks between biology and robotics, which also is there with the concept of self-configurable robotics. Uh, uh, is, is here this intersection between biology and robotics. Now, one thing I like a lot is this bi-directional interaction between robotics and biology. The fact that you can use a robot, um, basically use it, biology as a source of inspiration to make robots for outdoors, mainly to do inspection, transport, agriculture, or search and rescue. But one thing I like a lot as well is, is this feedback loop, how a robot can be used as physical models to test hypotheses about biology. And here on the right, I wrote a review paper that explores a bit all these very nice research projects which have done exactly that. So a robot can be an amazing tool to study neuroscience, to study biomechanics, hydrodynamics, paleontology even. And I like this, this use of robots as a, uh, as a scientific tool, basically. So the first part of my talk will be to cover that, how a robot, how modular robots can be used to understand and explore questions about neuroscience. And to do that in my lab, we have developed over the last 20 years, several uh, amphibious-like robots that are indeed very modular. They all usually use the same type of modules or subset of modules. And the interesting part is that they're amphibious, so they can swim and um, crawl or walk outside. So today I'd like to present Salamandra Robotica that we use to study the salamander on the top, on the bottom right, and a very new robot Agnatax that we use to study lamprey or eel-like locomotion. So let me start to motivate why we do this. 
So we are very interested in, in how understanding how the biomechanics together with the nervous system interact to produce this beautiful locomotion. So here, if you think about it, this dog nervous system is solving a very complex control problem. It has to coordinate more or less 200 muscles in a very good way to, to not fall. And this is a very complex problem because it's highly dimensional, it's highly nonlinear, it's hybrid with changing contacts over time. And it's impressive how, how well it does. And, and animals rarely fall. Even we as humans, we, we rarely fall. And even more impressively, this agility competitions that you may have seen, where, where dogs have to get scores to, to try to pass a parkour as fast as possible without mistakes. And here it's beautiful how multiple types of sensory inputs from vision, from the vestibular system, all play together to have very high agility. So I think in robotics, we're making very good progress and Boston Dynamics is doing amazingly well, for instance, but we're still not there yet at, at this level of agility that animals have, which I find very, very impressive. Now at the first, at the first uh, level of abstraction, there are, I think, four main ingredients behind this beautiful locomotion. First is the, the musculoskeletal system, system. The biomechanics itself is, I think, very well designed to do already locomotion. And then the spinal cord is amazing. So the spinal cord in vertebrate animals has, as you know, multiple reflexes. So very fast feedback loops to stabilize locomotion. And also something you might not know, it also, also has neural oscillators. So local population of neurons that can oscillate that are distributed all over the spinal cord to control the different degrees of freedom. Um, and I see central pattern generators, which I'll call CPGs. I see them a bit like feed-forward controllers to, to produce good patterns for locomotion. Then you have the higher part of the brain, all this descending modulation that will modulate the activity in, in the spinal cord. But what, one thing which is quite interesting is how, how much the spinal cord by itself is already sufficient. So if you look at the first video that I showed, my, my hypothesis in that case, the brain only sends a drive signal, a very low dimensional excitation signals that will activate the, the spinal cord activity. And it's only in the second video that you need more fine tuning of the movements, more descending modulation to, to do all this agility. But basically the spinal cord by itself is already very, very powerful to do locomotion. And a big question we have these days in my lab is to see this beautiful interaction between reflexes and central pattern generated in the spinal cord. And one of my goals today is to show a bit how we model them, but also to try to convince you that these can be very good building blocks for controllers, for locomotion controllers for self-reconfigurable robots. Okay, so if I, if I look at this organization, I think it really makes sense uh, what nature has done to have this multi-layered control where the spinal cord is in charge of sending the high dimensional signals to the muscles so that the high part of the brain just needs to modulate a few limited set of descending pathways. And here I like this image of Jerry Lubb who proposed to see this as a puppet on strings. We're playing with a subset of strings. You can activate rhythms and modulate them. And you, you don't need to have too many of them. Just a few of them are sufficient to generate a whole, a whole set of movements. And this is a good idea because you, the high part of the brain doesn't, doesn't need to worry about all the muscle and muscle fiber signals that you need to generate. It, it's lower dimensional. Another reason why it's a good idea to have the spinal cord really in charge is that neurons being very slow, uh, it's important to keep the state information local. So it's important that reflexes are as fast as possible. If let's say all the time you have to bring that state information to the motor cortex, it would be very hard to do fast movements. The delays would be too big in the control loop. So to summarize, and, and by the way, during my talk, I will every so often have these little boxes that are a bit take-home messages. I see the spinal cord as very interesting for lowering the bandwidth communication between high part of the brain and the spinal cord, to have fast feedback loops, and to provide building blocks for movements, uh, like motor primitive, that high parts of the brain can play with to generate um, rich movements. Okay. So in my lab, we have been fascinated by this, this, and we want to see how during evolution, possibly the respective role of 
the central pattern generators, the feed forward control versus the feedback has changed possibly. So we believe that in lampreys, it's more feed forward driven uh, in salamanders as well. And the more you go to mammal locomotion like cat and humans, the more it's sensory driven and the more descending modulation becomes important. But to test this type of uh, hypothesis, we need models. So that's what we do. We make uh, different types of models for the spinal cord circuits. And we test them in closed loop with robots to have real embodiment. So now I don't have time to present all these projects. I'll start, I'll briefly present the salamander results and then the lamprey results before going to self-reconfigurable robots. So the salamander is a, is a beautiful animal. It's a very old animal, it's an amphibian. And it's like a living uh, ancestor of all terrestrial vertebrates. So if you look at the first vertebrates that started to move on the ground, they had a body plan very similar to the salamander. And what's interesting is salamanders have very different types of locomotion between swimming on the left and, and walking on the right. So with colleagues in neuroscience, we, we, for many years, we have tried to model these circuits by starting with swimming circuits, as you find in eels or lamprey, and exploring how you should extend this kind of swimming circuits to add locom walking on top of swimming. And we are able to test several control architectures that are based on the circuitry of the animal to explain how the animal could do switching from walking to, to swimming. Especially that there's one thing that's very fascinating in the salamander is that if you electrically stimulate the descending pathways, at low level of stimulation, you induce a walking. If you stimulate a bit more, the walking uh, frequency increases. And at some point, it switches automatically to swimming. So just changing the global stimulation applied to the network makes a global change of locomotion between walking and swimming. And so we made several types of models, but the most abstract models, which are also very good as controllers for robots, are just coupled nonlinear oscillators. Uh, so with two state variables, one for the phase, one for the amplitude, and they are coupled together to produce uh, locomotion patterns. And uh, they are very abstract, but still representative models of the neural circuits that we know exist in the real salamander. Okay, so let's look at how this uh, works on, on the robot. So I just heard, an, uh, I guess it's uh, a little sound here. I'm not sure if there's a question, but let, let me show you here um, the swimming and the, the walking behavior of the animal. So what's interesting here is by playing with just two descending signals, the red signals, we can modulate both the speed and the heading and the type of gate. So if we give a low level of stimulation, as you see here, we have the walking gate. And if we give the high level of stimulation, as we do now with a remote controller, so we have a remote controller, we give now high level of stimulation, it switches to swimming. And we can even control the direction by just stimulating more one side than the other. And I think this is the beauty of the spinal cord. The spinal cord only needs very simple descending pathways, like these strings on the puppet. And then it's the spinal cord, the CPG in this case, that's completely in charge of modulating all the locomotion signals. And I think this is beautiful for, from, from a neuroscience point of view. It's also super interesting for robotics, because if you do this on your robots, you, if you manage to have this low level, robust locomotion controls, you can have very, very good locomotion control based on CPGs. So to summarize, in this case, we demonstrated that central pattern generators can modulate speed, heading, and type of gate under the modulation of a very few drive signals. And also what's possibly interesting for reconfigurable robotics is here, when we un if we unscrew the some some um, uh, um, if we just unscrew some connectors here, we can have the robot splitting different parts because we 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 are able to really Im implement these controllers in an in distributed way. So every module has a microcontroller, every module has a battery, and therefore uh, communicate with the canvas. But if we separate them, we can still locomote uh, because of this distributed implementation. Okay, so that's, I think I'll come back to that when I present the room bots because we do exactly the same on, on the room bots. 
Now, a big question in, in neuroscience is how to generate, how is locomotion generated in animals? And people in neuroscience have proposed two main uh, concepts. One is that we should see locomotion as a chain of reflexes, where sensory feedback is a key part to generate rhythms. And the other is that uh, locomotion is more based on this central pattern generator, the oscillators. It's a bit more feed-forward view of locomotion. And there's a very nice review paper by Art Kuo here that, that systematically explores what's the optimal way of combining the sensory-driven versus the CPG-driven locomotion. And he nicely showed that combining them is optimal. But this is a, still an old debate that started in neuroscience with Sherrington and Graham Brown. And it's also a debate between whether the peripheral nervous system, which is the sensory signals, or the central nervous system, which has the neural oscillators, are more important. And it's also a question between feedback control and feed-forward control that we know is important in, in robotics. So the interaction between sensory feedback and central pattern generators is obviously the body. And here, robotics can be very important to show how a good, a well-designed body can do locomotion. And as you know, the most extreme case of a well-designed body is a passive walker, a mechanical system that has no actuator, no sensing, no computation, but it can just walk down a, a ramp with gravity providing energy. So that demonstrates that a well-designed body can, in principle, do locomotion. In a similar way, fish, for instance, can swim very well thanks to very good body properties. So here you see a trout swimming in a, a, a street of vortices. So you don't see the vortices, but there are vortices in the water. And the, the trout can benefit from this. And this is so extreme that here, in this case, it's, fact, it's in fact a dead trout, a dead fish. Just the biomechanics of a dead fish can benefit from the flow, in some, in this case, to swim forward, uh, showing that it has very good, interesting uh, viscoelastic properties. Now, we, we now want very much to explore how this interaction between sensory feedback and CPGs uh, happen. And there we went back to lampreys and eels. Because eels are, are very impressive fish because they are super robust against spinal cord lesion. If you, if you take an eel and if you cut the spinal cord in one place or even another place, that means you remove coupling between the neural oscillators, it can still swim and almost in an identical way to the intact swimming. And that means there must be some mechanism below the lesion that, that keeps the rhythm active and keeps it coordinated with the rest of the body. And that must be sensory feedback. So that must be sensory driven because that's the only information available locally since the descending pathways are, are completely cut. And so, for, for several years, we have looked at the role of sensory feedback uh, in, in swimming. So one thing we immediately knew is that sensory feedback is important to handle perturbations. So if it's, for instance, if you have a speed barrier, as you see in this little animation, if there's no sensory feedback, if you open loop, you are pushed away and you cannot cross this perturbation. Well, if you... In the lamprey, which is kind of an eel-like fish, we know there are stress receptors, local stress receptors. If you feed these stress receptors back into the local circuitry, it acts as a stiffening mechanism that allows to, to cross this perturbation. So that's obviously the first reason to have sensory feedback, is to ha help handle perturbations. But now, sensory feedback can do even more than that. It can even generate locomotion. And that's in a recent paper we published uh, several months back, where we want to see how the tactile information that fish have on their skin, where they can measure forces, interaction forces with the water, we wanted to see how that sensory information can also be used for locomotion, for swimming. So local sensory feedback loops from pressure feedback. So here what we did is make, again, very simple models where we have the local oscillators, the population of oscillators, uh, we call the CPGs. We have the coupling between the oscillators, the CPG coupling, and we have this local feedback from pressure sensing that only affects the local oscillator. And with that and the robot, 
and also simulations, we could test very systematically uh, what happens if you remove one and not the other, and how what's the best combination of the two. Okay, so we designed the robot, and we have this local feedback feeded into the, the robot. We also have simulated muscles, like to give a bit of viscoelastic properties. And then what we did is, in a very systematic way, explore what happens if you have only the coupling but no feedback. If you have only feedback but no coupling, the decoupled case. If you even remove the oscillators, or if you have the combined version, the one on the right is the one we know exists in the animal, which has everything. But we wanted to study the effect of each component separately. And maybe the most interesting result is the one of the decoupled case. So this, this is the case where we remove coupling. It's like the eel with spinal cord transactions. We, we cut away all the couplings within the spinal cord. There's still a local oscillator, but it cannot communicate with the others. And we want to see how the local feedback can still help possibly to generate swimming. And interestingly, it worked amazingly well. So we were a bit surprised by how, how well this works. So here I'll show a video. And please look first at the left. So look at the left video. Here at the left, on the left side, you see we start with random initial conditions and then um, without coupling, and there's no feedback. I'll now play the same video again. It's slower. So you see there's no feedback. There's no coupling. There's no way these oscillators can synchronize from random initial conditions. And therefore, the swimming is, is very bad. Now look on the right side of the video. In this case, we still have no coupling. But now we have the feedback, the local feedback going from the pressure sensors to the local oscillators. And what you see here in the slow down video is that a beautiful traveling wave emerges thanks to this very local feedback mechanism. And you will now see it again in, in, in normal speed. You see, it takes a bit of time, but very rapidly, you then have a beautiful traveling wave. And this is amazing because these oscillators cannot communicate directly. They only receive the feedback. And it's really through the embodiment, the physics, and the sensory signals that they can synchronize. So it's a beautiful way of sensory signals synchronizing completely decoupled oscillators. And this works also very well on, on the robot, uh, as you'll see now. It takes a bit more time to stabilize, but here you should imagine all these oscillators start with random initial conditions. They feel the local pressure little by little through the embodiment and through the fluid providing information. You see a beautiful traveling wave, traveling wave emerging. And it's really close to the optimal speed you can have. So it's, um, it, it systematically converges to a good forward traveling wave. And the fact that we go forward, that's asymmetric, is due to the asymmetry of the body. The fact that we have a passive tail at the end breaks the symmetry and makes this go swim forward, as you see here. Obviously, the animal has everything combined. So if you combine the oscillators and the feedback, you have even better swimming. So here, what you'll see is the transients are shorter. And, and you see that very rapidly now it's, it goes to very nice swimming. So everything together is better than only the oscillators or, or only the feedback. And especially uh, what's beautiful is once you are combined, you become very robust against lesions. So I don't have time to go in details. So I suggest you read the paper. But what we did is we systematically applied all kinds of perturbations to the network, like destroying sensors, destroying couplings, even killing some oscillators. And we mix a bit this uh, perturbation disruptions with an increasing number. And we simply looked at how speed decreases the more you disrupt the system. And if it's dark gray, it's good. You, you keep a high speed. But if it's white, you don't have a good speed. And the combined circuit was always systematically much more robust against perturbations than any of the other controllers. So that, that basically explains why we have these redundant controllers. Uh, each of them separately can walk, do a good job. But together, you become much more robust against lesions than any of these mechanisms alone. So that's probably the, the reason why we have um, this redundancy in the control system in swimming. 
Okay, so this concludes the no science part. So basically, my take home message is the spinal cord offers very sophisticated control circuits and, and a beautiful inspiration for robotics with a few descending pathways activating very rich motor behavior. Very good redundancy between CPG driven locomotion and sensory driven locomotion, which is, I should, I think we should always see locomotion as a self organizing mechanism, very robust. Um, we have this hypothesis that the respective role have changed during evolution. Um, and finally, uh, as we'll see next, uh, we really like this concept of CPG based controllers or spinal cord inspired controllers because of it's very robust, it can be distributed in a uh, it can be implemented in a distributed way and it's very fault tolerant. Okay, so that's it. Let me now switch to um, briefly, uh, rapidly to self recovery robotics. Um, I see I'm a bit over time, so I will go a bit faster. But here the idea is to see how the concept of modular robotics can be useful for assisting people with limited mobility. And I, I've been a big fan of self recovery robots for, for many years. So um, I always followed it with big interest. And uh, we took inspiration from this to make what we call the robots, which are self recovery modules that can attach and detach to the ground. And we wanted to see how we can use them for different things, but in particular to create furniture. Because as I'll explain a bit later on, we want to use uh, furniture or the environment to assist people who have lost mobility. So that's why we call it room bots because they are to be used in, in, in rooms and make assistive rooms. So we wanted to design the room bots, first of all, as a framework to explore lo locomotion learning and uh, with arbitrary morphologies. We also like the topic of self reconfiguration. And finally, we want to, to make something useful. So we, we, we want to make this assistive furniture and assistive environments. So uh, the robot's hardware is like, this is one module, what you see here is like 22 centimeters. It's more or less 1.5 kilo heavy. And we took strong inspiration from the Molly cubes from uh, Vikov and uh, Lipson, but we added, we connected them together and added one degree of freedom to allow rotation between the two. And we also have connectors that are inspired by one of the versions of the Mtron for, for connecting things together. And we have distributed electronics, but I'll, I'll skip this a bit. So let me show you how this works. So this is one room bots modules. You see the de three degrees of freedom activated and they, are, they have the diagonal axis of rotation. And thanks to this, we have quite some space of movement we can create between these four house spheres. This is the dynamic connector, which was, as mentioned, inspired from one of the m -trans. And with this, we can connect to the grid, to the ground, and we can connect to neighbors. And that, that starts to open all these beautiful options that self configurable robotics offers, is creating building blocks that can move by themselves, that can attach to each other, and, and that have very interesting properties. So here, Francis, uh, I'm very happy that our modules can do what we call this on-grid locomotion. So a single module can here move around in on the floor, on the on the wall, and even up to the ceiling. So that's kind of interesting. If you are in the grid, you, you don't need others to move around. A single module can have this locomotion abilities. So what did we do with this? As mentioned, one one thing we did is to study locomotion, a bit like animal locomotion. And here, there's a direct link to what I presented on the salamon and the lamprey, in the sense that, as well on the robots, we can locally program the local oscillators. They communicate via Bluetooth to create coupling. And then we can run an optimization algorithm to see what's the optimal shape of the, let's say, the, the parameters of the CPG to have patterns of locomotion. And we can that well we locomote. Um, so we do that with different type of algorithms. In this case, it's a particle swarm optimization, but running on board of the robot. And within half an hour, because the, the search space is not that big, we can get very interesting gates and um, basically adapt to different types of morphologies by doing this uh, CPG tuning. 
So here, I really think that CPGs become very good building blocks because indeed uh, they, they naturally produce oscillations and they, um, they're very good substrate for learning. And at the end, interestingly, we got a gate that's quite similar to the Salamander gate in, in this particular case. So here's an example with real hardware, a slightly different morphology, um, where we, we learn this online. And, and you see that you also get interesting gates uh, moving moving uh, with the real hardware. Um, and, and here, I like the notion of using optimization to explore the space of gates, um, because you, you might generate gates that you would not design as an engineer. Like some of those rotations go beyond uh, 360 degrees. And, and makes a fun way of moving around with with the hardware. So that's what, what I call off-grid locomotion, when you do locomotion completely outside the grid of connections. Now, we also want to do on-grid locomotion with self-reconfiguration. And here, as you know, uh, and other people are more expert than we are, but this is a, a very challenging task, because this is now really exploring a tree of possible options. You have this uh, curse of dimensionality, the explosion of possible options. And it's a very pro big problem how to get your 20 modules go from configuration A to configuration B. And we do it in different ways, uh, either in a decentralized way with gradient base, but that can get stuck in local optima. Or with fewer modules, we can do in a centralized way with more traditional planning. And I'll briefly explain, explain this planning here. So the idea is to reduce a bit the space of, of all possible movements to discrete actions with discrete angles, and um, then to really think into voxel, like a 3D voxel space. We don't allow any type of configuration. We stay in a voxel space to reduce the options of structures, but still with a very large range of things we, we can do. Then, of course, to search faster, we need some, some tricks. Uh, we, we, when we have the tree of possible options, we prune the tree to remove things that are not interesting, like that have collisions, things that try to break a kinematic chain, um, things that not re lead to a meaningful connection, or things that even lead to modules that would drop, so we, we prune this out. Uh, we keep history to avoid loops, and we have some additional heuristics where for instance, if we plug two modules faster in space, and we, we have a lookup table that allows us to, to move these things faster in space. So sorry I go a bit fast, but you find the details in the paper here at the bottom. But doing that, we, we can now do nice on-grid locomotion where we can, uh, for instance, ask this module uh, automatically by itself to find a way to cross this little barrier. So the, the search algorithm will find an optimal way of moving from here to here uh, to the other, the other pace. Also, what's interesting is if you ask modules, both modules to go to the ceiling, they'll, they'll discover, the search algorithm will discover that's good to collaborate. Rather than each of them moving around the, the walls, it's a good idea to collaborate and help each other to go up there. And that's automatically found by the, the optimization algorithm. Similar thing, if you ask the modules to go down, they will also discover that the fastest way of doing that is to collaborate, help each other, and then you can go down to, um, to, to the, the, yeah, a new configuration to the ground. So these are all, all things that emerge from, from the, the, the search space um, and the A-star algorithm that we, we use. And at the end here, this is an example where we have to cross a barrier. Um, and here you find also a bit like social insects that construct a bridge, like uh, these, these ants that construct a bridge. Uh, the algorithm is finding a way of, of doing that. Now, the most complex thing we did is to construct a chair automatically. We, we, we did it in two stages. So we, we had a mid configuration and then the end configuration. Otherwise, the search space was, was the search was taking too long. But here you, you basically have, a, a, we found a sequence to automatically construct a, a table, a chair, sorry. So sometimes we have to help it a bit, by the way, the connector is not perfect. But this is a way of, of self-constructing uh, furniture. Uh, on my side, I love to construct my own furniture. I, I'm a fan of IKEA, but uh, if you're lazy, you could just press a button and the furniture would construct itself. 
Now, very rapidly, because uh, we I'm close to ending, I think two, two more minutes. Now I want to say how we start exploring the use of these modules for assistive furniture. And here the idea is to little by little embed help in the furniture or in the environment for people who have lost mobility. Like if you're in a wheelchair, it could be interesting to have the table bring uh, something to you rather than having you to go to a glass of water, for instance. And here what's interesting is that uh, we can connect our Roombots module to existing furniture. So this is an IKEA table to, we give, to which we give mobility, as you see here. And it, it can move, it's remote control, but it can adapt to slopes, it can adapt to steps. And it starts, therefore, to brief, give interesting functionalities to, to uh, a table. We also have a universal gripper. So now a table could bring a, a, pe a pen to somebody who is in a wheelchair, as opposed to have the person come uh, and go to, towards it. And it can also do simple manipulation abilities from one to the other using the universal gripper. So this is a bit of a dream, is to, to start exploring how could we embed all this technology in the environment and indeed make sure that indeed the furniture is there to help move out of the way when you cross the apartment in a wheelchair and then uh, comes back to help you, or also give stability for elderly. And uh, finally, I really want this to be fun technology, something that's not only interesting for, for assistants, but just fun to, to have functionalities and or even to play games with kids. So that's a bit the dream for the robots. And finally, uh, this, I think the robots could also be applied to reconfigurable factories or conference rooms, or even in space, possibly, um, that could be alternative applications of the robots. Okay, that's it. I was a bit over time, but I hope this was interesting. I'd like to thank a lot the, the, the people who did all the work and also the funding that you see here at the bottom. And I'm now very happy to take any questions. So thanks again for your interest. And just if you wish, uh, I'll play a video in the background while we, while we take the question. So, but this is the end. So uh, thanks for your attention. All right. Thank you, Professor Eiffel. Uh, the talk is very uh, impressive and inspiring. Yeah. Uh, is there any questions from the audience? Um, Yes, actually, most of the people in in the in, in making the module robot, they are trying to make a, a structure of things uh, only using the module robot. But I saw that in your uh, last part, you are trying to combine uh, the module robot with the furniture, which I think is a very genius approach to make the application more effective and efficient. Yeah, I appreciate it very much. Yeah, so, uh, all right. I completely agree. I think that that's a bit underexplored is how how to have a heterogeneous systems, maybe active modules together with passive modules. I think that's the way forward because then for instance, if you want to make a table, it's a bit silly to use many modules to make a flat piece of wood. Uh, so that's exactly something we like to explore, mixing active and passive components. Yeah, I, I think that uh, that's yeah. important. Yeah, actually, if uh, using uh, only using the module world to build a chair or table is uh, very difficult to, to make it yeah, and make it useful because uh, yeah, it's not uh, maybe not very rigid enough to hold something. Yeah. Okay, so uh, it's time to have some questions. Is there any questions? Uh, hi, Professor. Uh, thank uh, thanks for your wonderful talk, which is very inspiring. And I'd like, like to ask a question. Uh, I think uh, the uh, working model mode of CPG does not does not look very complicated, but uh, it is. I think it's very effective. And uh, could you um, please explain the reason uh, why uh, uh, from a biological point of view? Yes, yeah, so, so so I think nature has evolved this oscillator as building blocks, and, and uh, these are very good uh, bases for, for locomotion. So indeed, once you have the oscillators, you the main thing you then need to adjust to get locomotion is to adjust the, the coupling such that you have the right phase lag. For instance, sometimes you want maybe to have anti-phase behavior, sometimes in-phase behavior. And then, uh, so the phase lag is important, then the amplitude is important, 
and possibly the waveform, what exactly you're doing with the joints. But having these as building blocks, it's kind of normal that the learning then goes quite rapidly because you, you don't you already have very good basis for doing locomotion. And I think both during learning and during development for different morphologies, that's what nature has done. It's just reorganize a bit these blocks, these very useful building blocks for behavior. Okay, yeah. Thanks, perfect. Yeah, thanks for the good question. Yeah. All right, we have a question in the chat box. Uh, hi, Professor, I'm a freshman. I'd like to know which major's knowledge do you think is the most important? I think it means uh, what's the important knowledge to make a modular loop or to, to generate some uh, central patterns or uh, else. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> also meaning which, maybe which educational program to follow possibly. Yeah, that, I think that's a very, very good question because uh, indeed I'm lucky that in the team, we have people with very different backgrounds. Some, some are more uh, computer science, have more computer science background, which is very important for good uh, software engineering and good programming and also machine learning. Some are more control people, some are more mechanical, and some are more from electronic background. So uh, I think to, to make a good uh, modular robot, self-configurable robot, you need a bit to mix all these skills. Uh, interestingly, I, I was a physicist. So I, I, I was never trained as a roboticist. I became a roboticist later. So the, even if you don't do robotics, there's still hope for you to do robotics later. But I think um, it's important to any of these pathways is very good to go to robotics. I think it's always good to, to learn a bit about the other fields. So learn a bit about mechanics, learn a bit about control, uh, learn a bit about electronics, even if you're from another field. Because uh, as you know, robotics is really the the, the the science and the art of integration. So bringing it all together is important. So having a bit of expertise on multiple topics is important. And uh, rather than being completely a pure specialist on the subset. So I would say many pastors bring to this, but you need to combine then a bit expertise from, from different backgrounds as well, if that answers the question. Yeah. Okay, and another question is, uh, it is in Chinese, maybe I try to translate it. Uh, how mature of the uh, current technology for the modular robots and how would it be in the future? What's the application will be in the future? Yeah, that, that's a very good question because that's a bit uh, something we suffer with, with is that our, our modules are still prototypes. They're still quite fragile. They, they're not perfect. You see that we don't cheat in the video. So every so often, uh, uh, an external person has to, for instance, to help with the reconfiguration. And uh, bringing this technology to be very robust, uh, low cost and everything, all these topics that Professor Mark Yim has addressed is still a challenge. Um, and um, in our case, we, we're still not there yet for um, a product, let's say. Um, we, what we're thinking is uh, by exploring, by having a quite expensive uh, Roombots module, we can explore the space of good solutions. And then as a product, I think it will be a subset of these that will be cheaper and easier to make. It might not be as complicated as a Roombots. Like for the furniture, we might not need a dynamic connector or we might not need all these three motors. So it looks by using the Roombots, we want little by little to discover what the, the right technology and then hopefully have startups make this as a stable and mature technology. So I, I would say we're still at the prototype level to answer your question shortly. Right, all right. Um, okay, the next question is, uh, do all the modular robots share one battery or each of them have their own battery? Uh, yeah, we we have even more. We have uh, three batteries in total in one module. So, so, uh, we, so every, uh, we have three batteries per module. And interestingly, something we want to do that we haven't had time to do is to do uh, a power line sharing because in a big robot, uh, often some modules will have their battery uh, leaking or uh, being depleted more rapidly. So some, the connector ideally should also be a power line so that also that we could share battery and ideally recharge from a single single place. So that's not there yet, uh, but but for sure we have many batteries um, all all over the place. Okay, thank you. Uh, the last question is: 
uh, for the robot, is it a uh, is it controlled individually or they are central controlled? Is yeah, so that's a very good question. So, so um, we we do a bit of mix. So, so uh, for the locomotion, uh, for the locomotion, it's very distributed. So uh, we 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 give maybe a high level information on what's the speed, and then the optimization finds the uh, the, the right way of, of of moving with local oscillator and, and distributed implementation. So that's decentralized. For the reconfiguration, we try decentralized and centralized. What I showed here, the planning is centralized. You have a computer knows everything, makes the plan and, and tells every module where to go. Uh, so that's in the future, we like to extend that to decentralized planning and learning. We did a bit in the past with gradient based uh, decentralized approach where every module has also local information. But that was often getting stuck in local minima. So depending on initial conditions, you never go to the final configuration because it's too decentralized. So uh, yeah, ideally we should, I think, have a mix of decentralized and centralized, but we tried a bit both. Okay. Um, the next question is about the simulation uh, tools. Yes, uh, he said, uh, I was curious about why your team have decided such powerful tools for simulation and what is the difficulties for designing such tools? Yeah, yeah. So we, we spent quite some time uh, doing um, simulation development. So either we use Webbots, which is a, um, an, now an open source professional um, uh, software package. So we use that for the Roombots. We have used that extensively. For the, the a bit more complicated uh, salamander and lamprey like locomotion, we develop our own simulators based on um, either PyBullet or Mujoko now as physics engine. And on top of that, we add our fluid dynamics and our uh, uh, yeah, models of the robots on top of that. So, uh, but these days, Mujoko, by the way, is, is very is very good. So we, we, we use that as a physics engine and we build on top of that with our own fluid uh, simulator. And it's, it's indeed worth doing it properly because then we can do many things in simulation and the sim to real transfer is quite good. So we can, uh, both for learning or for doing scientific questions, we do many things in simulations and fewer things in hardware. Okay, thank you. Um, we have one question from, from the Zoom, which is Guan Qi. Oh, hello, Professor. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Uh, I noticed that the several of words that, that you mentioned today are, were published in science, and some were also published in the, in the journals in the robotics field, uh, such as TRO. Uh, we know that the scope of science are, are different from the journals in the fields of robotics. Uh, as a roboticist with rich experience in published in these journals, uh, as well as a member of the uh, editorial board of science. Can you share with us what kind of robotics work uh, can be published in the top journals like Science and Nature, and how this work differs from the work in robotics, uh, robotics journals? Thank you. Yeah, yeah so, so that's a very good question. So, so um, indeed, we are lucky to, to, to be able to have paper in science and nature. But uh, I think for, for this, you really need something very new and ideally interdisciplinary. Uh, the, so far, things that are purely robotics based, like the robots, we, we never even tried or managed to, to go to science uh, or nature or science, science robotics. Uh, so, so uh, I would say for these high journals, you, you need a bit some interdisciplinary, something uh, novel, where, where ideally you have a nice connection to biology to another field, which, by the way, is absolutely there in, in self reconfigurable robotics, because you can maybe have uh, nice links to how cells, uh, like self-repair or, or growth process, all that, that. I think that, that are beautiful topics that would be perfect for science and nature. I think now science robotics uh, accepts many papers that, may be less interdisciplinary. So interestingly, it made things a bit more difficult to go to science because men, often the science editors will say, oh, try to go to science robotics. So the uh, science robotics is now a very good venue as well and has a high impact. So to answer your question is, is for science and nature, you, you need to be interdisciplinary and very, very new. And otherwise, science robotics and TRO or IJRR are very good venues as well. But I think the, it's, it's mainly because science and nature is a bit general public. They are not technical journals, but general public. 
So yeah. that's why being a bit interdisciplinary helps to go to get in there. Thank Does you. that answer your question? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, okay. The last question: uh, Is this necessary for modular robots to introduce soft robot technology in order to further improve the environmental adaptability? The question is: If it's useful to introduce soft components of soft technology? Soft technology, maybe soft robotics technology. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Soft so, robot for, yeah. for modular robots, maybe. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. So, so uh, adding soft components, compliance or not, uh, we 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 always have a bit of compliance everywhere in all our robots. It goes good and bad. So, so uh, uh, in general, I think it's a good thing because you 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 are a bit more. You can had, handle impacts. You can be less accurate in in the contacts with the environment. Uh, but softness is very hard when you want to do reconfiguration because then we already suffer with our robots being badly aligned and, and everything and uh, you, you get structures that should be supposed to be straight but are bent. So there being hard is, is, is better. Uh, so I think the perfect way for me would be to combine hard and soft like our musculoskeletal systems, bones and, and softness or tensegrity structures like uh, Mark Kim presents are so beautiful. So. It's indeed uh, finding the right trade-off. Softness will help in many cases, but will make probably reconfiguration a bit more difficult. Uh, but indeed, we it's for sure um, uh, it's for sure it's at the combination that's the you find the, the sweet spot. Being too hard is bad. Being too soft is bad. Combining the two in a clever way will be the solution, and it's what biology has found. I think that's a very good question. All right, thank you. Uh, I think it's time to end the Q&A session. And let's thank Professor al Kaisper again for your excellent sharing. I believe our audience will have or, or have learned a lot about, about it. So, okay, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. It was great to be part of this. Thank you. All right, so uh, let's introduce our second speaker. Um, which uh, with, uh, Our second speaker is Professor Julian Boswa. He's a professor of computer science at UBFC in France. He is part of the computer science department at the Fimto ST Institute, CNLS. And his research interest includes distributed intelligent MEMS and programmable matter. His work, uh, uh, his, uh, he has worked for more than 15 years on this topic and has co authored more than 100 and 80 international publications. He was an invited professor at CMU, uh, Emory, uh, Emory University, and Hong Kong Polytech University for different periods. As a PI, he led, uh, he did different front research projects uh, such as smart surface, smart bros, computation and coordination for MEMS and programmable matter. And he's currently leading the program about Meta Consortium, and he also organized uh, many, uh, organized and chaired many conferences. And today, uh, Professor Boswa will talk about the programmable meta projects, realizing a meta made of autonomous robots. And as I can remember last week, our speaker, Professor Yim and Professor Peterson discussed about how small can a module robot be Today, I think you may find out the answer from Professor Boswa talks. Okay, uh, without further delay, let's welcome Professor Julian Boswa. Thank you, Professor Lam. Uh, so first of all, uh, I would like to say that I'm very pleased to be, uh, to be here uh, today for presenting uh, our work. We, we, you can see in the founders of the project that we have uh, some funding coming from Hong Kong. Uh, some times ago, so uh, uh, China has always been uh, in the in the collaboration of the of the project. So today, I will present you the the progresses that we have made on uh, on the topic of uh, modular robots, uh, but very at the at the very small scale. Let's say. So first of all. Uh, where do I come from? From the east of France, um, a CNRS laboratory called FemtoST, 
uh, with approximately uh, 800 uh, members. Uh, the CNRS is uh, one of the biggest uh, research structure in, uh, in France and also in the world with many uh, Nobel Prizes and uh, medal fields and with a, a number of people of more than uh, 100,000. So the, the outline of my presentation will be uh, the following. First, I will present you uh, our vision on the programmable matter. Then uh, I will skip to hardware design, software, some art, and the, the future works. So first of all, what do we want to, to achieve? We, we would like to, to achieve uh, exactly the, the same thing as you can see on this uh, movie, uh, Big Hero 6, where these uh, talented uh, young uh, student design uh, a very small robot um, and which is able to stick to others to create shapes. Okay, so what could be the, the applications of such, uh, such a small robot? The, we envision four uh, potential applications. The first one is in collaboration with uh, the car manufacturer Stellantis. Uh, to enable uh, an easier way to design parts. So you can see here that an engineer has done a, a rear view, the design of a rear view. It can transmit them directly into uh, programmable matter, and the designers can work by hand on this matter, removing some parts or adding some others, modifying the, the design, which can be updated in uh, real time in the in the CAD uh, in the CAD tool, and which could perform all the uh, resistance calculation, for example, or molding uh, molding process, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the second one uh, deals with the, the interfaces. So you all know the graphical interfaces, uh, which are very practical because you can display whatever you want. But the problem is that you have to look at the interface to, to control. Uh, on the other way, you have tangible interfaces. Uh, they allow eye-free contact uh, interaction, but uh, they are not very modular. And most of these uh, interfaces are uh, encountered in the professional uh, world, either for sounds, a camera or for cockpits or airplane, for example. What we'd like to do is a human computer interface using programmable matter, which would allow uh, eye free usage with a real interface, but also which would be reconfigurable uh, and which will allow user defined interfaces. The first, the third one. Uh, imagine that you have a, you are a surgeon. You have a complex surgery to uh, to do. You take a, an MRI of uh, the patient, which will create some uh, 3D uh, images, and you can then uh, test in uh, for real using real matter using uh, programmable matter. It can also be used for students. And the last one is. In space, you need uh, you have restricted space and weight, so having tools that can be reconfigured would be a would be a good uh, a good solution. And for example, you can see that you don't have the same tools when you are outside or inside the, the shuttle, for example. To do this, we we have built a consortium, uh, which comprises uh, a research lab or universities in computer science. Uh, MEMS design, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, art, and also industrial partners, both in France and in, in the US, uh, which comprises uh, approximately 40 uh, persons working on, on the project, either permanent or uh, non permanent staff. So let's begin by the hardware design of the, of the robot. Um, the project started in 2006 at Carnegie Mellon University uh, using meter size uh, helium balloon uh, with electrostatic uh, actuation. Then they go to 
decimeter, centimeter, eventually millimeter. Uh, and for now on, we are trying to, uh, uh, to build the next generation moving in 3D and also being fully autonomous because this, this robot wasn't able to compute, for example. Uh, we have all the, the parts uh, now that, are, that have been produced and we are now working on the assemble uh, all, uh, all these elements. And uh, the future, we were, uh, okay, we're talking about uh, hardness versus softness of the robots. We are trying to, to see if we can bridge the gap between both worlds doing an element that is both deformable and hard when it, when it stands. So let's talk a bit about geometry of the, of the robot. Um, we have first placed um, 12 uh, connectors that you can see in, uh, in red. Uh, these connectors, when you draw a line, uh, it creates a truncated uh, cuboctoidron. Um, but this shape is not very good for moving, so we put some parts of cylinders between the, these, uh, these red uh, electrodes, and it creates a new kind of uh, geometrical structure, which we call the uh, catome for claytronics uh, atom. Um, they are placed in a FCC uh, lattice, and they can move using uh, their two kinds of uh, actuators, either the green or the, the blue one. Uh, and in the future, what we envision is to have this kind of element, either with hinges or uh, with uh, flexibility, which will be able to move without losing contact, as you can see. The electrodes always stay, uh, stay in touch. But I won't talk about this uh, for, for the rest of the, of the talk. So now, what is the, the structure of the, of the robot and how uh, we plan to, to make it? So first of all, we have the, the electrodes, which are composed of uh, a parallel, uh, flexible uh, element that can conduct the, uh, the electricity. And uh, we, we are using electrostatic forces. So these... Um, uh, these elements uh, are the following. So first we have the, the shell. You can see half uh, of the shell here. It's a rigid uh, element. Inside uh, the shell, we placed uh, the electrodes, part of the electrodes, and um, a computing unit uh, of the M cube. It's a complete computer with a battery and a voltage upscaler, computing uh, unit. We use uh, uh, a Cortex M0 for, uh, for computing. And then we, we had the second uh, part of the, of the shell and we close uh, everything. Um, the shells are 3D printed using, using a, a high precision uh, printer, uh, which is called a Nanoscribe. Um, we add the, the electrodes that we call the, the flexiboard. So you can see that we have structured uh, on, the, on the electrodes some, uh, uh, some metal plates that are used to stick between, uh, between two, uh, two cathodes. Regarding the, the electronics, as I told you, we, the pro first prototype are using the Michigan Micromote, M-Cube for, for short. Uh, what is nice with the M-Cube is that, first of all, the size is very small, and we even use uh, a smaller version of the, of the M-Cube that has been specially designed for, uh, for the Caton. So here, as I told you, we have a, a processing unit, and um, uh, a battery. We have PV cells for communication uh, with, uh, with the base station. Uh, we could also have wireless communication, but we don't use them uh, in, uh, in this project. 
Um, and the nice thing is that all these layers are swappable. We can remove or add some, uh, some of them. Uh, you can see here another picture on which you can see the, the PV cells on the, on the top. The nice feature of uh, MCUBE is that they really studied the, the standby power. It's less than 8 nanowatt, uh, which is very low, and which allows it to, uh, to have up to seven years uh, lifetime. So regarding the, the power, because it's really uh, one of the main uh, issue, uh, we have spent the last two years to design the, uh, the high voltage generator. Why is that? Because the, the, the electrostatic uh, actuators are using 100 volts at least to, uh, to operate. And the problem with the conventional uh, driving circuits uh, is that they are using individual charge points, uh, Dixon charge points, to be uh, more precise, which uses uh, a large area. And we, when you charge one, you lose uh, uh, a lot of, uh, of power. So to replace this, we have used one ramp of, uh, of charging uh, pumps and uh, Below this ramp, we have a, a high voltage multiplexer, which allows us to charge only once the, all the, the charging pumps and then to select the correct uh, power we'd like to, to transmit. So here you can see the, the wall uh, unit uh, with the, the high voltage uh, driver. Uh, you can see uh, the wire bondings to, to the electrodes on the the, the, the side of the high voltage generator. Uh, you can see also uh, here encapsulated, uh, unencapsulated or the version that is encapsulated. Um, the shape is a bit strange because it needs to fit inside uh, the cathode. And the, the two nice features of this uh, circuit is that we are able to generate 120 volts and with a very low power consumption, around 300 nanowatts to charge uh, all the charging pumps. And after that, the consumption is very low because electrostatic actuators uh, almost uses uh, no charges. So let's see now the, uh, the actuation. Uh, we made some experiments to see if the shape was able to, uh, to roll with uh, external uh, actuation, and uh, it works. So now we have to, to perform experiments with uh, the real uh, robot once they will be integrated. So that's uh, what we are working on uh, currently. Um, so the, the driver and the M cube are coming from University of Michigan, the shell from France, the flexiboard for University of Tokyo, and the final assembly takes place in France in a spin-off of our lab called Persecure Robotics, uh, because we need to have um, a, a robot that is building the robot. Um, so you can see here first experiments of uh, uh, assemble, assembly um, uh, the, the robot. Um, and now we are working on a, an automated system to, to do this. Um, meanwhile, we have also designed uh, other kind of robotic structures, uh, simpler ones so that we can teach uh, with them uh, with the same processing unit, uh, NARM Cortex M0, and uh, the same uh, characteristic. I mean, the communication are possible only with uh, your neighbors. The difference is the actuation. Uh, they are not moving, but they can glow in different colors. They can play sound and communicate with their neighbors. And we have uh, 1824 uh, blinky blocks. So now let's switch to uh, the software part. Uh, first, I will begin with a, a presentation of our simulator called Visible Sim. Visible Sim 
is an open source behavioral simulator for lattice based modular robots executing distributed algorithms. It is developed by Femto ST Institute. It performs a deterministic simulation of systems composed of similar robots in different flavors of 2D, oh, sorry. 2D or 3D lattices. Visible SIM is used by many roboticists and computer science researchers and is available on GitHub. Several kinds of robots can be simulated and Visible Sim is designed to easily add new robotic architectures. Smart blocks are moving in a 2D square lattice, sliding along each other, whereas hexanodes turn around a neighbor in a 2D horizontal hexagonal lattice and 2D catoms in a 2D vertical hexagonal lattice. Blinky blocks are a bit different, as they do not move, but can glow in different colors. Real hardware blinky blocks have been fabricated and they are fully operational. Simulations made in Visible Sim have been compared to executions on real hardware and have shown the high precision of Visible Sim for distributed algorithms, synchronization time and mechanical resistance evaluation. 3D catoms and datoms are our latest development of hardware. They operate within the same lattice, but their modes of movements differ. To test the performance of Visible Sim, we have designed a stress test experiment consisting in simulating a sort of concurrent Brownian motion over as many modules as possible within a square grid. At the start, a single leader module activates and sends an activation message to all its neighbors. Upon reception of this activation message, modules turn into the activated state. Activated modules then alternate between a 0.5 second wait and a random motion lasting one second. When a motion ends, the moving module sends an activation message to its new neighbors, if any, before starting the next wait-move cycle. The simulation ends when all modules are in the activated state. Visible Sim has been able to simulate up to 32 millions of robots, which is the highest number of moving robots ever been simulated. This sets a new record. Visible Sim can help any researcher to develop, test and debug distributed algorithms for modular robots. It also offers a powerful visualization tool for effectively communicating research results. Okay, so now we are uh, using Visible Sim to uh, test different kinds of uh, algorithm. I will present you just a few of them. Uh, for example, uh, designing the, the center. So first of all, what kind of model are we using? Uh, our robots all execute the same program. They have uh, a unique ID, a processing unit, memory. They can only communicate with their connected neighbors using messages, and we assume that they are placed in a regular lattice with potentially imprecise clocks, and they can move. So what is the, the specificity of a modular robot regarding a distributed uh, algorithm? So first, imagine that this circle is a, is a robot. If you connect two robots, you have two informations. Uh, the connection is physical and it's also a network connection. And this represents a graph. And this graph uh, embeds these two informations that can be used, for example, to derive the, the shape of the, um, of the robot. And what is the, the difficulty here? For example, if I ask you to find the center of this uh, graph and the center of this robot, finally. You immediately say that its blue point is, uh, is the center because you have a, a global view of the, of the system. The problem is that the, robot, uh, uh, the robots don't have the global view and uh, they are unable to construct it because we assume that uh, uh, we will have millions of robots within a, an ensemble. So um, we need to, 
to design distributed uh, algorithm, fully distributed algorithms. I will present you here uh, the calculation of the of the center or the centroid. There are many definitions of the of the center. So let's start um, with a uh, first uh, robot which initiate the the computation. Uh, it can be the the robot that has the minimal ID, for example, as we can see here. And then we, uh, we elect uh, the farthest node uh, from A that we call uh, K1, and then farthest node from uh, K1, which is K2, etc., etc. And this leads to uh, restricting the distance between uh, all these uh, K, and potentially at the end uh, coming up with one node which uh, has the minimal distance to all the others, which is elected uh, as the center. So it's working in simulation. It's also working for real. You can, uh, for example, removing some, uh, some robot, as you will see here, and the center is recalculated. And the, the nice feature here is that if you reconnect the, the robot, the center is not the same because it's, uh, it, it's not unique and it's, all, it's not a fully precise algorithm. It's an approximate uh, election of the, of the center. And the nice thing is that we are using very few memory space because uh, it's bounded by the maximum degree of the tree connecting uh, all the robot. So six or 12 in our case. Uh, we have also worked on synchronization of ensemble. If you take uh, uh, an ensemble of blinky blocks and you want to do, for example, a scroller, or you want to move, have a synchronized uh, movement, you face some uh, synchronization issue because the clocks are not precise um, in these uh, embedded uh, components. And after some minutes, uh, all the elements are not synchronized uh, at all, as you can see. So we elect uh, a time master, which uh, will pre-calculate the clock drift of all the elements and send very few updates at the end, because there is uh, a static model of the, of the clocks that are embedded in, into, uh, into this, uh, this algorithm. Uh, one of the nice features of uh, distributed uh, algorithm that you can see is that you can separate the two, uh, the two parts of the scroller and it's still working. And that's, uh, that is the strength of, uh, of distributed algorithm. Um, okay, and it can be used also to display uh, any kind of shapes on an ensemble of, uh, of blocks. So here you can see a famous painting. OK, now self-reconfiguration. Um, the, the, the hard thing about self-reconfiguration is that the configuration space and the branching factor are all uh, exponential, which create uh, an intractable optimal uh, planning. So we try to, uh, to apply heuristic for uh, coping with this uh, intractability. Um, our first experiments and in other groups uh, shows that it takes lots of time to reconfigure some, uh, some robots. So we wanted to, to cut this, uh, this time. Uh, because if it takes lots of time, it's not very applicable. So we designed several methods uh, that we call sandboxing, a result of module that is underneath the object, scaffolding, making a scaffold of the, of the object, and then coating to have the, the right visual representation of the, of the object. And with this, we were able to, uh, to do simulation with real measurement of movement to create a scaffold in six seconds with uh, more than 1,000 uh, robots. Uh, the algorithm is very simple. I won't detail it any further here, but it's three uh, agents, uh, 
uh, free roles of agents that the robot can take depending on their situation uh, inside the, the ensemble. Um, the construction of uh, the scaffold is made from uh, tiles. Uh, so the construction of a tile is uh, a process uh, that is uh, well known for the robots. And then they can construct many tiles all linked uh, together which creates the, the scaffold. And the main issue is here is to, is to respect the order of, uh, of construction of, of the scaffold. Uh, so here you can see construction of different kinds of uh, shape, a uh, simple shape, a cube, a cylinder, half sphere, and a, a pyramid. And you can see that it can go really fast because we are using uh, all the potential movement inside the, the, the scaffolding. In fact, robots are flowing from the floor to, to the top uh, almost, almost constantly uh, during the, the reconfiguration, um, which allows us, by measuring the rotation time of uh, our robot, to do some simulation with this time, which would show a reconfiguration, a reconfiguration, a reconfiguration time sorry, of uh, approximately six, six seconds. Uh, it's a lower bound. It will probably take much more time than that, but it gives us um, an estimate of the total time for reconfiguration in seconds more than or in minutes. Uh, rather than uh, hours. We have also done some uh, mechanical modeling. So the robots are able to assess if uh, the link between them will break. And you can see that either in simulation or in the real robot, it's working. And uh, they can also detect uh, an instability. If you add one robot at some point, they will just uh, fall down. OK, now another interesting part of, uh, of the work is the, uh, that we have two artists that have worked for uh, two years producing some, uh, some hard works using the, the BMP blocks. <laughs> and the complexity of what we have built has gone uh, um, farther and farther. We, we start with 100 blocks. Then here, several uh, hundred blocks, 40, uh, 40, more than 400, sorry. This artwork in uh, Paris, Grenoble, uh, in different uh, museums, and we had uh, now 40,000. And this was the biggest experiment with all the blocks that we had. And we have applied and we have had. Uh, for the record for this uh, for this shape. So to finish, uh, what next? We we work from uh, the moving actuator, the power transfer as well. Uh, as Oke has said, it's a real uh, difficult uh, problem. Uh, we are still working on visible seam and on distributed algorithm in self configuration also. And my talk. We have four PhD grants uh, available. If you want to apply, you can send me uh, an email. And you can find all the source code of our uh, project on the, our GitHub and more information on our website.
thank you for, for listening and I'm available if you have any question. Thank you, Professor Julian Boswell. Uh, okay, it is a very fantastic talk. Uh, is there any questions to ask uh, Professor Julian? Uh, as I can remember, I met you several years ago in IRO's conference, yeah. And you have shown me the, uh, uh, the prototype of the programmable matter. So uh, it really impressed me a lot. I never thought that uh, a modular robot can make in a millimeter scale. Yeah, yeah. So I, I would like to ask, um, what is the uh, current bottleneck of uh, making the, uh, the uh, programmable matter? What is the critical path for, uh, to uh, make it big through? So we, as I said, we have spent two years on the voltage upscaler um, because it was very complex to generate uh, high voltages inside such a small element and uh, especially without uh, having power leakage. Um, so we studied different, uh, different voltage upscaling uh, methods um, and uh, some of them didn't work. I mean, didn't meet our requirements, especially regarding power leakage because we can't afford to have any <laughs> any leakage at this uh, size. Um, and uh, so now the, the, big, uh, the big stuff that we are doing is trying to remove the battery. We would like to, uh, to work fully autonomously uh, without requiring uh, any battery because the battery is really cumbersome. Uh, it makes the, the life of the robot uh, smaller uh, because at some point the battery will uh, will fail and uh, and we won't be able to, to replace it. Um, so we try to, uh, to minimize the power consumption of the, the whole ensemble and to to have our robot using the minimal amount of power. So that will be the the I mean the next thing that will keep us busy and uh, also the flexible uh, robot. All right, cool. Okay, uh, so let's take some questions from the audience. Is there any questions from the audience? All right, we have uh, a question from the chat box. Okay. Uh, I'm very concerned about the mechanical constraints, which are very important for local motion and reconfiguration. Do you think it is time consuming to check the uh, modular cell reconfigurable system stability based on a linear elastic FE model? How can we execute this check quickly? Uh, it, uh, so uh, uh, find an animal model, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's uh, a real issue. Uh, we are uh, we have worked with the uh, uh, University of Luxembourg and uh, IPPT Pan in uh, in Poland to uh, to set up some uh, some algorithm to to be able to perform this uh, this calculation, and uh, it takes uh, uh, lots of time to to check. Uh, the mechanical uh, constraints. Um, so now we are currently uh, trying to see if we can simplify uh, the, uh, the algorithm. And we started a, a brand new project with other groups that have other ideas uh, about the, the mechanical calculation. Maybe to have more approximation uh, regarding the, the mechanical stability of, uh, of the ensemble, but it's uh, it's for sure one of the uh, most difficult problem that we'll have to, to solve if we want to really uh, do some reconfiguration, taking into account this mechanical uh, structure, this mechanical constraints. What we are doing now is that we, we are trying to build the structure in a way that we won't have uh, mechanical instability. So that's how we are working right now, but it would be better if we can have 
this online calculation. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question from the chat box is uh, for just for such large scale of multi agents, have you ever considered the computational cost when using the distributed algorithms? How long will it take if we have ten thousand robots? Um, as the um, the algorithms are fully distributed, and as they are using uh, local informations, uh, most of our algorithms are not taking uh, lots of time to, to execute. And we even try with uh, uh, our ensemble of uh, Blinky blocks. So same processing unit, approximately the same capacity to, to communicate. The main bottleneck is not the computation, but the communication. Uh, because when you need to have um, some communications between all the elements, if you rely only on the contact by contact communication, it takes uh, too many times. So in, uh, in that case, uh, for example, for flashing uh, all the, the robot, for the Blinky blocks, we are using um, the point to point communication. It doesn't take so much time for uh, 2000 nodes. It takes like uh, some milliseconds. Uh, but if you have millions, it's probably better to have some kind of broadcasting. So that's why we kept the PD cells on our robot and we are able to flash the program inside the robot using the, the PD cells. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and another question is about does Wistable Sim consider the dynamics of modules such as collision detection and graffiti stability? Do you have any suggestion for implementing uh, attachment and detachment in simulation? Because more of the current simulation engine require a robot with a fixed connection relationship be, uh, to be defined before simulation. Thank you for your suggestion in advance. Okay. Thank you. Um... Um, visible sim is a behavioral uh, simulator, meaning that we really execute uh, all the, the programs into threads. And what is simulated is the 3D world. But we don't uh, simulate uh, right now the, the mechanical part of the physics. It's only a, a behavioral simulation, meaning if you want to move from one point to another point, we will detect collisions, but we won't be able to detect if uh, the structure is overloaded or, uh, uh, or if it will fall down natively. But you can run the algorithm that we developed, which is uh, doing this uh, calculation about uh, mechanical stability and uh, uh, bondage uh, breaking, uh, but it's not natively integrated into uh, into the simulator because it would take too many times to uh, to simulate. We rather prefer to have I mean, uh, simulation that are going fast. All right, thank you. Uh, okay, another question from the chat box is: uh, How do you guarantee the global task just using the local information? Um, for certain kind of algorithm, we are able to prove this, uh, this convergence, but for some others, uh, that are more complex, uh, we don't, I mean, we can see that it's working because we test with a, a random a configuration, huge number of modules. Uh, but we have no proof that it's uh, that it's working. And uh, uh, all the tricks is uh, actually to to be able to to generate this uh, global behavior using only uh, local information. So that's the difficult stuff into the the distributed uh, algorithms that we are designing. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
other questions from the audience? Um, okay, I have one question in the chat box. Uh, is the visible seam open source? Can we customize our own robot in it? Oh yeah, it's uh, very easy to uh, to develop new uh, new robots. Uh, there is uh, even a tutorial to, to do so. Uh, we have also um, uh, a web page which uh, allows you to generate the basic uh, code for uh, putting uh, inside the robot. And uh, if you if you have problems to, to do so, you can uh, you can contact us. Uh, because uh, the, the version that is public of visible sim is not the, the final one. So maybe we have also robots in the private one that could fit your, your needs. OK, thank you. Um, all right, uh, because of the time limit, uh, I think uh, it's ta the time to wrap up. So again, I would like to thank our speaker, Professor Julian Boswa and Professor uh, Alka Eisbert. Uh, for their fantastic sharing. I hope all of you will enjoy the talks uh, today. So uh, let's choose that we will continue to have two another speakers to talk about modular cell configurable robot. So please stay tuned and welcome to join our events. See you this week. Bye-bye. Thank you for the invitation. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.